Parasite is what many are calling the film of the year. The comedy-slash-thriller from Korean director Bong Joon-ho follows a penniless family called the Kims who con their way into the home of the super-rich Parks. Their scheme escalates until the film reaches its whirlwind ending, one you'll be mulling over long after you leave the theater. Let's take a look at those last few scenes in Parasite and unpack the loaded social critique within them. And obviously, spoilers ahead. The turning point in the film is signaled by a powerful rainstorm, which sets the backdrop for the Kim's shocking discovery. Moon Wong, the park's original housekeeper, has been hiding her husband in the basement of the house for over four years. This torrential downpour began suddenly, but it was foreshadowed in an earlier scene, the water fight between Giyu and the drunk man outside the Kim's apartment. The storm does more than just set the mood for the Kim's revelation, and the brawl between families that ensues. It's a vehicle through which Bong Joon-ho examines climate change, an issue he's tackled before in films like Snowpiercer and Okja. Here he focuses on a particular aspect of the climate crisis, its unequal repercussions on the rich and poor. For the parks, the storm is a minor inconvenience. It means their cushy camping trip is rained out. For the Kims, as we soon see, it's a catastrophe that nearly costs the family their home, and almost all of their belongings. While the Parks get on the sofa to watch the rain from their huge glass windows, the Kims descend from the hilltop mansion to return to their rapidly flooding subterranean apartment. The rain flows with them throughout this entire downward journey, making the flooding of their home pretty much inevitable. This is what Bong found the really sad element of that sequence. In such a hierarchical urban landscape, where the wealthy reside up in the hills and the poor live literally below ground, there's only one way the water and sewage can flow. Down. A disproportionate amount of the waste is produced by households like the parks. It does require huge sums of resources for that family to maintain their perfect home, expansive garden, and suite of luxury cars. But the ecological cost of that consumption stays hidden, because modest living families like the Kims, who walk everywhere, live mostly on leftovers, and have few material possessions, end up bearing the brunt of the impact. Bong shows how climate catastrophe can heighten existing class tensions. The day after the flood, as Gi Tech drives Mrs. Park around on her errands, she keeps raving on the phone about what a blessing the rain was, as it cleared out the air pollution and left a nice blue sky for their outdoor gathering. We traded camping for a garden party, she jokes to her wealthy friend, disregarding the significant portion of the city that the storm effectively displaced. Gi Tech listens to this out-of-touch conversation from the driver's seat and can barely hide his resentment. Just a matter of hours ago, he was wading through sewage to save himself and his family. These strained class relations reach their climax at the party. The explosion of violence that's to come is foreshadowed by Mrs. Park's table arrangement, which she models after the crane wing formation, a famous and deadly military maneuver of Korean naval hero Yi Soon Shin. The Parks are celebrating their son Da Song's birthday, which also marks the anniversary of his traumatic run-in with Gun Se, the man living in the secret bunker below the house. Gun Se is not dead yet in the physical sense, but he suffered a social death as a result of his poverty. The flickering light that he uses to try to communicate is a classic motif of ghost tales. This isn't the only place in Parasite where the specter of capitalism's ghosts inspired Bong's depictions of poverty. Production designer Lee ha Jun modeled the Kim Street off of ghost towns in South Korea that were set to be torn down, places that felt haunted by the traces of people who live there. South Korea and the US both have large and growing wealth gaps, which may explain the eerie similarities between Parasite and an American film released the same year, Jordan Peele's Us. Bong said that when he watched the Us trailer, he was taken aback by the thematic parallels. Both films focus on the theme of doubles, juxtaposing two families that mirror each other in many ways, but exist at opposite ends of the class spectrum. One of the posters for Parasite depicts the Kims and Parks as reflections of one another. The Parks are the picture of wealth that the Kims aspire to, and the Kims are the labor that must be exploited to make the Parks' extreme wealth possible. 
At the party, the Parks go to absurd lengths to indulge their son's fixation with quote-unquote Native American aesthetics. Bong used this motif to critique capitalism's way of reducing complex cultures into surface-level commodities. The director also observed how the Kim's takeover of the Parks house, only to find someone already living there, was analogous to American colonists settling on a land that was already occupied. The Park's coddling of DeSong's Native American obsession reaches a new height when Mr. Park recruits Ki Tech to act out a mock Native American battle in stereotypical costume and headdress. When the camera lingers on Ki Tech's face, you can see his growing resentment. It's clear that he's reaching his breaking point. During the festivities, Gi U suddenly decides to check on Gunse in the basement, taking the landscape stone with him. Since the very beginning of the film, when the rock was given to Giyu as a gift from his cooler, wealthier friend Min, it's come to encapsulate his hopes of a more dignified life for his family. Here he brings it to the basement not as a weapon, but as a sort of peace offering. This backfires when Gunse uses a stone to deal two blows to his head. The rock started out as something supposedly magical or symbolic, and ended up as nothing more than a weapon. Now more than ever, the complete obliviousness of the Park family makes some remarkably easy targets. The family's self-imposed isolation from working people means they will believe anything about their employees, even projecting an elaborate sexual fantasy onto their driver. Every day, the Parks make an effort to distance themselves from the people of the underclass and the brutal conditions that they live in. For the ultimate example, remember how Gunse got all that blood on his face doing an extreme version of his daily routine, which involves beating his head against the wall to turn on the lights for Mr. Park. The rich patriarch, who has no role in the upkeep of his own household, has always assumed that the lamps are activated by motion sensor. The manual labor required to make Mr. Park's life so comfortable is invisible to him. Now the ugly underbelly of the system is finally rising up, and the Parks don't see it coming until it's too late. The party's warrior theme may be one reason that no one even glances at Gunse when he first walks out on the lawn. The blood on his face happens to resemble war paint. He instinctively makes a beeline to Ji Jung, seeking to exact revenge on the Kim family for locking him up and killing his wife. This is a culmination of one of the most tragic aspects of class conflict and parasite. The lack of solidarity among members of the working poor. Parasite, of course, looks at class warfare, but it's not always as clean cut as just poor versus rich. In fact, some of the film's most brutal scenes show working class people fighting each other tooth and nail. The fight choreography in these sequences makes the divisions explicit. The Kims must protect their place in the Park household by literally getting on the backs of their fellow workers, even kicking one down the stairs and locking another in the basement at the very bottom of the hierarchy. It's also clear through more subtle interactions, like the Kims' metaphorical tug of war with the pizza shop manager in their neighborhood. At the beginning of the film, the manager criticizes the Kims' box folding and refuses to pay them in full for their work. Once the Kims make a little money, though, they return to the shop and order a sit-down pizza from her. While they look pleased and amused at the reversed power dynamic, she's clearly bitter about it, slamming their food on the table. Bong has addressed the disunity of the working class before, in his 2009 drama Mother. In both films, he said, the have-nots are fighting each other, and that's sad, but also realistic. Bong makes it clear in Parasite that Moon Guang and her husband have much more in common than not with the Kim family. There's a moment when Chung Sook discovers the two families have this commonality, but stops short of saying it out loud. She's reluctant to identify with this other family's hardships, and when Moon Guang begs for her cooperation on the basis that both families are needy, Chung Sook insists that she herself is not. Ultimately, the Kim psyche is embodied in their semi-basement home. As Bong said, you're still half overground, so there's this sense that you haven't completely fallen to the basement yet. The director pointed out this general rule that the poorer you are, the less sunlight you have access to, referencing the windowless tail cars in his 2013 sci-fi film Snowpiercer. So it's significant that Parasite opens on a fleeting moment of sunlight inside the Kim's home. 
They don't have direct access to the sky like the parks do, but they're not completely deprived of the sun yet, like Jun Se. Subtle nuances like these matter more than they should in a stratified society with a convoluted pecking order. These complex hierarchies are reflected in the many sets of stairs in the film, both inside the park and Kim houses and connecting the entire distance between the two. As production designer Lee Ha Jun said, the spaces in this film are compartmentalized and all connected through a very complicated staircase. Parasite shows how these fine distinctions in class status only function to keep those at the bottom divided, driving them to fight amongst themselves in the hopes of making marginal gains at each other's expense. While the workers have to claw at each other and even kill each other just to fight over the wealthy's leftovers, the park's privileged position allows them to exploit others without having to get their hands dirty. At the party, though, the violence of capitalism finally comes to the surface, fully exposing the park's cowardice and the limits of their humanity. At the outset of the rampage, it immediately becomes clear that the parks aren't all that concerned with the fate of their employees, not even their son's beloved art teacher. Instead, the family and their guests immediately try to flee. In the midst of all this chaos, Chung Suk stabs Gun Se in self-defense, leaving him to bleed out on the lawn. In his final moments, Gun Se looks up and smiles at Mr. Park, the man he's long glorified. Respect! It goes without saying that the respect has never gone both ways. Bong has said that it would reflect the story better if this film was titled Parasites, plural. After all, there's more than one parasite in the park house. The Kims, of course, worm their way in. But there's another parasite who's already burrowed deep and has been long feeding off his hosts. And the parks are parasites too, perhaps the biggest parasites of them all. They leech off the labor and desperation of their workers, without giving anything back except the bare minimum means for survival. Now, as Gitex watching his daughter take her last breaths, Mr. Park keeps yelling at him to hand over the keys to the Mercedes. An exasperated Mr. Park is forced to retrieve the keys himself. That means he gets a whiff of the man's scent. Mr. Park stops what he's doing to hold his nose in disgust, revealing his deep-seated disdain for the poor and a disregard for the lives of those beneath him. This feels like a direct affront to Guy Tech. In a fit of rage, he rises up, takes off his headdress, and takes a knife to Mr. Park's heart. The bloodbath ends abruptly on a shot of Guy Tech fleeing the party, leading into a much more still and quiet epilogue. After awakening from a coma, Giyu realizes that his father has gone into hiding in the bunker, and is effectively stuck there now that a new family has moved in. Throughout the film, Giyu and his family were motivated by what Bong called a weird mixture of hope and fear that you can fall even lower. That fear was validated halfway through the film, with the introduction of this secret stairway leading down and down. And it's fully confirmed for us by the end, when Gitek essentially takes Gunse's place underground. What about vertical movement in the opposite direction? In a letter to his dad, Giyu vows to work every day until he can afford to buy the mansion. Then he writes, all you'll need to do is walk up the stairs. This devastating line sums up the myth of social mobility for the poor. Yet even as Giyu fantasizes about reaching higher ground, Bong won't let us entertain any such illusions. The camera tracks down to show Giyu back in the semi-basement where he and his family started off. The director described this shot as a surefire kill. If an audience member was still clinging to any false hope about Giyu's fate, this final shot would wipe that out once and for all. The credits roll to a song called Soju One Glass that's performed by Che Ushik, the actor who plays Giyu. The lyrics, written by Bong, explain how Giyu spends the rest of his days trying to earn the money. The song's original title was 564 years, because that's how long it would realistically take Giyu to save up for a house like that. Bong said he did this cruel calculation to express his fear that the status quo he critiques in Parasite won't improve in his or his son's lifetime. Interestingly, Parasite doesn't portray working people in a sentimental light, nor does it paint the super rich as cartoonishly evil. It's not a personality contest, and there aren't any obvious heroes or villains. Bong may be known for making monster movies, 
but in Parasite, the monsters are harder to see. They're systemic and far-reaching, and because of that, all the more daunting.